Greetings! Welcome to our lecture series on noise. I am Beza Rozavi. In this first lecture, I would like to accomplish the following. First, I would like to talk about why noise is important and we need to study it. Uh, then uh, I will talk about uh, what noise is from an intuitive perspective and uh, spend some time on characterizing noise for circuit analysis. Following that, uh, I will talk about propagation of noise in circuits and how its spectrum is shaped. And finally, I will describe the concept of correlated and uncorrelated noise sources and draw an important conclusion that helps us in circuit analysis. All right, well, <clears throat> noise seems to be the last barrier in circuit design. Through clever techniques, we have managed to uh, uh, correct for many imperfections in our circuits and systems. In an RF receiver, for example, we can calibrate mismatches and offsets. We can calibrate even nonlinearities, but generally we cannot calibrate noise, simply because noise is random and not predictable. Uh, also, a critical problem is that there is always a trade-off between noise and power consumption. So, we could uh, design circuits with extremely low power consumption if we had no noise. But uh, noise limits the, uh, the, puts a lower bound on the power consumption that we will have. Now, the trouble with noise is that it is everywhere. So if we look at uh, pretty much any circuit today, uh, from RF receivers to pipeline A2Ds to other systems, we have noise. In this case, we are dealing with low noise amplifiers and low noise mixers and baseband circuits. In the case of pipeline A2Ds, we have to worry about the noise of the op amp and the noise of these switches, which appears as K2 over C noise. In the case of SAR A2Ds, we have to worry about the noise of the comparator and the noise of these switches, K2 over C noise again. Similarly, uh, there is noise in oscillators, and the noise of the transistors becomes uh, phase noise. Uh, we have noise in charge pumps that are using PLLs, so the noise of these current sources translates to phase noise. And even in power management circuits that are just low frequency circuits, evidently, we have to deal with the noise of, for example, band gap references or LDOs, op amps in LDOs and everything else. So a noise appears in pretty much any circuit that we consider today and it, places a, it poses a certain trade-off in our design space. All right, now, uh, as our first step, we have to understand what we mean by noise. And let's start with more familiar signals that are deterministic. For example, they are periodic. If we take a, a signal generator that produces a sinusoid and look at its output, it's a nice, simple waveform that we are used to analyzing. We can incorporate this waveform in circuit analysis easily. We can predict what the results will be. The nice thing about this waveform is that the value of this voltage at T1 can be predicted from the previous values that we have. So it's a deterministic waveform. On the other hand, if we, for example, take a microphone and place it near a river and pick up the sound of the river, that will be a random waveform. And by that, we mean the value of this voltage at time T2 cannot be predicted at least not accurately, from the previous values of this waveform. So that uh, poses an interesting problem for us in circuit analysis. If the noise of various devices in our circuit as a function of time is random, we cannot even draw it accurately, how do we incorporate it in our analysis? How do we find its effect on the performance of our circuit? Uh, so we have to approach it from a slightly different angle. In other words, we are looking for some aspects of noise that are user-friendly. We can use them in our circuit analysis and ultimately in predicting the noise performance of our circuits. And that is the question. What aspects of noise are user-friendly? All right, well, as usual, we start in the time domain and see what we can decipher from the noise behavior in the time domain. Now going back to our familiar deterministic signals, for example, uh, 
a periodic waveform. Well, remember that we can define an average power for such a waveform. For example, if a voltage of this shape is applied to a resistor of RL, then the average power delivered to RL is obtained by squaring the voltage, dividing it by RL, and finding the average over one period of this waveform. So that's easy enough. But uh, how do we do this for a random signal? Can we associate an average power to a random signal? So here's a situation. We have a microphone picking up a random signal or noise and delivering some power to this resistor. So how do we do that? Well, in analogy with this equation, we will write out the same expression, but now we don't have a period to speak of. So what we will do is we will calculate this average value over a very long um, period of time, over a long stretch of time. In other words, we let t go towards infinity. And hopefully, that number will be a constant value a constant average. So for example, in the case of a river, if the river water flow is not changing from day to day and there's no storm, uh, the microphone generally picks up a certain signal strength and the average power that we expect is constant. Uh, in practice, of course, this T cannot be infinity, so we have to make it long enough to capture the dynamics of the signal in the time domain. And by that we mean, if the signal consists of various frequency components, we want this T to be long enough to allow us to observe the lowest frequency of interest. So if this noise has a frequencies down to one kilohertz, then this T should be some milliseconds to allow us to measure the average power of those one kilohertz components as well. So that's how we would determine how long T should be. Okay, now, uh, in practice, we don't like this RL because, in fact, in many of our circuits, there is no RL. In other words, there is no physical power delivered to an RL. So one view is we just pick RL to be one, and we will call it normalized power. Uh, so there's no RL anymore. Another view would be, well, we just calculate this expression, and if there is an RL at some point, we will divide it by RL to find the average power. The important point here is that the unit of this average power is watts, whereas the unit of this average power is not watts anymore. It is actually volts squared. So that's what we have to remember, that this unit is volts squared, whereas this unit is watts. Otherwise, they are similar and we can use them uh, uh, as necessary. Okay, so this is really all we can decipher, all we can extract in terms of knowledge of a random signal in the time domain. Beyond that, the time domain behavior doesn't help us much. Unfortunately, having the average power of a noise source does not help us altogether in analyzing the noise performance of a circuit. We need some more information. Uh, so then maybe we should go in the frequency domain and see if noise is more cooperative in that domain. So let's do that. Let's go to the frequency domain. And uh, again, going back to more familiar periodic signals, we ask ourselves, how did we view this signal in the frequency domain? Well, we took the Fourier transform of the signal and plotted the result. So the result was something like this. In the frequency domain, uh, here is zero. We are considering only the positive axis. And we ended up with an impulse at the frequency of F0 if this frequency is F0. That's simple enough, just an impulse. And uh, that's easy uh, to understand. That's easy to use in circuit analysis when we have deterministic signals, especially when we have periodic signals. But now that we have a random signal, how do we deal with this in the frequency domain? Can we just take the Fourier transform of this waveform and hope that it will give us something useful in the frequency domain? And the answer is not really. If we attempt that, 
if we just take the Fourier transform of this waveform, which is random, in practice, what we will see is something with very large fluctuations in it. And it's not very helpful in uh, giving us information about uh, the contents of this noise. So that's not what we do with random signals. In signal processing, we say instead of taking the Fourier transform of the signal, we take the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation of the signal. But in this uh, lecture, we will actually approach it from a more intuitive point of view. So we will not talk about autocorrelation. We'll talk about uh, this frequency translation, in this uh, conversion to frequency domain from a different perspective. And that brings us to the notion of spectrum. Spectrum is still what we call in signal processing the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation, but we will define it a little differently, which is much more intuitive to us. We define the spectrum of any signal, random or not, as the energy carried by the signal at each frequency. So let's uh, pause a moment and digest the meaning of this expression, which plays a critical role in understanding noise and analyzing the effect of noise in circuits and systems. Very well. Now, before we uh, deliberate the meaning of uh, this expression, this definition, let's just intuitively see if we can find some examples of spectrum. Uh, well, we know that when men speak, their voice carries mostly low frequency signals, and when women speak, their voice has stronger high frequency components. So that means that if I plot the frequency contents of a man's voice, I will get something like this. This is the spectrum, this is the frequency range of voice from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And for a woman's voice, we should get something that has stronger high frequency components. So intuitively, we would expect that this represents the energy carried by a man's voice at different frequencies, and this uh, represents the energy carried by a woman's voice at different frequencies. So these are examples of a spectra, even though we have not yet studied how the spectrum is computed. Another example is from optics. We know that if a white light it enters a prism, uh, then at the output, it, the light is decomposed into all the colors from infrared red to ultraviolet. So as if we plot the frequency axis this way, the frequency increases this way, and we can say that these represent the spectrum of the light, meaning how much of each how, how much strength does it carry in each of these frequencies. And it turns out that for white light, these all have the same strength. Okay, uh, before trying to construct the spectrum of signals in general, let me make one observation. Uh, let's look at the energy carried, for example, by a woman's voice at 20 kilohertz, right here. Well, can I say that this dot represents the energy carried at 20 kilohertz? Well, not really, because at a single frequency, the energy that we carry is zero, because the bandwidth is zero. So what we really mean is that this dot represents the energy carried by a woman's voice in a certain unit bandwidth. And that unit bandwidth can be one hertz, one kilohertz, whatever you want, but it, it cannot be zero. In general, we pick that unit bandwidth to be one hertz. So this point actually represents the energy carried by a woman's voice at in one hertz of bandwidth centered around 20 kilohertz. And this observation helps us compute the spectrum of various sources. Okay, so based on this observation, we can say the following. I take the signal of interest and I run it through a bandpass filter having a bandwidth of 1 hertz centered at the frequency f1. 
So F1 must not be confused with this bandwidth of 1 hertz. Out of this filter comes a signal, as shown here, XF1 of T, which has slower dynamics that one went in, because we have limited the bandwidth of the signal to 1 hertz, so it cannot change as rapidly as it wants. And now we need to find the average power of this signal that has only 1 hertz of bandwidth at a center frequency of F1. To do so, we square it, and we take the integral of this, find this average value over a long time, and that will correspond to one point on the spectrum of the signal. So that point would be right here. Uh, this represents the strength or the energy carried by the signal in one hertz bandwidth at a center frequency of F1. Okay, now, in the next step, we will change the center frequency of this bandpass filter from F1 to F2. We shift it over here and perform the same experiment, the same average power measurement. And that will be another point at F2 and so on. And that's how we construct this profile, this spectrum of the signal. The spectrum tells us how much energy we carry at this frequency or this frequency or this frequency, etc. One example of a spectrum is the white spectrum or white noise. White noise has a spectrum that's flat, meaning that the energy carried at different frequencies is the same. And this is similar to uh, the analogy with white light, as I mentioned before, and that's why this is called white noise. White noise exists in all of our circuits, so we have to be comfortable with it, and we have to be able to use it in the future. Okay, so we see that in the frequency domain, the spectrum of noise is much more helpful, much more intuitive, than what we obtain the time domain. And that's why we rely on the spectra of noise sources so much, and we we'll manipulate them, we use them we com uh, to compute the noise performance of an overall circuit. Very well. <clears throat> Let's suppose that we have a circuit that has a bunch of noise sources. So in our first uh, step of analysis, what we would like to do is find the contribution of each of these noise sources at the output. That makes sense, right? Okay, so let's focus on one source of noise, this source of noise, something in the circuit, and we'd like to see how this noise propagates to the output. Okay, well, how do we do that? Well, let's make a simplified model. So I'm going to Assume that I have a linear time invariant system with a transfer function of h of s, and I have an input x and output y. Okay? Now, if x is deterministic, like a sinusoid, then we know that to find the output, we simply multiply the Laplace transform of x by h, and we find the Laplace transform of y. But if x is random, so x in this case represents one of these noises that's trying to go to the output, trying to go to y. If x is, if x is random, we don't have its Fourier transform directly. All we have is really its spectrum. So if I have the spectrum of x, and I have the transfer function of this linear time invariant system, how do I find the spectrum of y? So going back here, if I have the spectrum of this noise, and I know the transfer function from here to here, how do I find the spectrum at this output due to this noise source? Well, that shouldn't be that hard. In fact, there's a theorem that relates these two. It says uh, the spectrum of the input times the magnitude squared of the transfer function gives us the spectrum of the output. Magnitude squared means Take the transfer function, the Laplace transform, replace s with j 2 pi f, and then it's a complex number. Take its magnitude, square it, and it has probably frequency dependence, and then multiply it by s x of f, the spectrum of the input, to find the spectrum of the output. That makes sense. This is not that different from Laplace transform of x times h giving Laplace transform of y, right? The difference is that here we are dealing with power quantities, 
and that's why this square or this magnitude squared appears. Right? These are not voltage quantities, they're power quantities. They're raised to the power of two, if you remember. Okay, so this is what we call noise propagation and shaping, because this noise source experiences a certain transfer function by the time it makes it to here. For example, if this noise source is white and the transfer function squared looks like this, then at the output, we have a noise spectrum like this. So we took a white noise source and we shaped it to look like this. And that's how it appears at the output. This is, of course, important and urgent for circuit analysis because as soon as we want to find the effect of these noises at the output, we have to deal with this uh, transformation. All right, one uh, simple example of noise shaping and noise propagation is in the telephone system. Whether you use landline or cell phones, it's the same thing. Even though our voice covers a spectrum uh, from uh, about 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, in the telephone system, because of the limited bandwidth they have available, they uh, create a transfer function that is only 4 kilohertz wide. And our voice is subjected to this uh, transfer function before it goes, uh, goes off to the other side. So uh, the voice spectrum of 20 kilohertz wide, after going through the telephone system, ends up looking like this. It's only 4 kilohertz wide. And that's why sometimes when a person calls you on the phone, you cannot recognize his or her voice, right? Because most of the spectrum is removed, so it's heavily uh, distorted, if you will. Okay. And the last concept I would like to talk about is correlated and uncorrelated noise sources. Uh, this is important, as we will see shortly. Uh, but first, let me start with an analogy to uh, give you a feel for what we mean by correlated and uncorrelated. Okay, so let's suppose that we have a New Year's party. It is at the end of the year, uh, approaching midnight. And at the beginning, there's a large party. There are a lot of people talking. So uh, the voice signal from each person is some random waveform. So person number one has some voice, person number two, etc. each have some voice. So that's fine. Uh, these signals don't have much resemblance because these different people are speaking about different things. Maybe even they're speaking different languages. And the net result, if you listen to all of these noises added together, will be some sort of composite waveform. On the other hand, as we approach midnight and a countdown begins, people, uh, all of them, start saying 10, 9, 8, and so on. So now, all of these signals have some resemblance. Here everyone's saying 9, here everyone's saying 8, here everyone's saying 7. So uh, the, uh, the, when these are added up, of course, the excursions will be larger because, in a sense, they are in phase. So this is what we call an example of uncorrelated sources, because initially these people were speaking about different things, uh, maybe even different languages. There was not much resemblance between these waveforms. Whereas here, uh, there is some resemblance, because they are saying the same word. Maybe with different accents, maybe some are women, some are men, but they, they are, there's a great deal of similarity between these signals, and that's what we call correlated. So, when we are dealing with uncorrelated or correlated noise sources in a circuit in a system, we have to be careful, and I'll show you why. Okay, so let's take only two of these, X1 and X2, and add them up, and look at the average power of this sum, and see what it does. All right, so no problem, we know how to do this. We said that the average power is given by that quantity squared, and then we integrate and average over a long period of time. So that's the average power of the sum of x1 and x2. Okay, well, uh, let's expand this. We see that we have a term, a integral of x1 squared, integral of x2 squared, and the integral of twice the product. The first term is the average power of x1 as if x2 were absent. So that's P average 1. 
The second term is the average power of x2 as if x1 were absent. So that's p average 2. The third term, however, is the integral of the cross product of x1 and x2. If x1 and x2 are uncorrelated, meaning they have no resemblance, the integral of the product over a long period of time will be zero. On the other hand, if they are correlated, there's some resemblance, and we multiply them and integrate, this integral will not be zero. So this term determines whether the two sources are correlated or uncorrelated. Now, if we are sure that the two sources are uncorrelated, we can drop this term and safely say that the average power of the sum of these two is equal to the sum of the average powers. And that's what we call superposition for average powers. So let me summarize this critical point here. Uh, <clears throat> okay, let's see. So what we see is the following. For example, let's suppose I have two resistors with a spectrum of S1 and S2 for the noises that they produce. So what I can say is that because the noise in R1 knows nothing about the noise in R2 and vice versa, these two noise sources are uncorrelated. There's no resemblance between the two. As a result, I can say that for the total noise that I measure between these two points, the spectrum, which is similar to the average power concept, will be equal to S1 of F plus S2 of F. Right? This is uh, like the first integral and second integral, because the third integral, the cross-correlation between the two is zero, simply because these two noise sources know nothing about each other. So this is the critical point that comes out of this observation, and it's very helpful where we are analyzing a complex circuit like this. I have different sources of noise, and I would like to find the contributions at the output. Now I know how to do that. I take the first source of noise, uh, pass it through the transfer function from here to here. That gives me the spectrum at the output resulting from this one. I do the same thing for the next source of noise, and that gives me the spectrum at the output resulting from this one. And if I know that these two noise sources are uncorrelated, meaning they know nothing about each other, I simply add the spectra of these different sources at the output, as I have shown here. So that points to a systematic approach to analyzing the noise performance of a circuit. And that will be the subject of our next lecture. I will see you next time.